And this is very exciting because we heard our speakers had a very nice conversation, right, with Vitalik. I would like to hear from our speakers what are the information that you learned during that meeting, and then we would like to learn from that as well. And we would like to first. Go over our yeah very first discussion topic. Especially, everyone's curious about the meeting contributions, right? What key points or insight did you share during the meeting? We would like to、uh, bring the discussion topic to Charlie from OK Link first. Thank you. Sure. Thanks for the question.、Um, well, we didn't get to share extensive insights at the、uh, Ethereum forum like the other speaker, but we did share a lot at the rest of the Econ Two developers. And、um, to give you a bit of context, we were invited to the event by Polygon as their first official explorer for Aglayer. And、um, Aglayer is fairly、uh, a fairly new concept and name. So for those that don't know, Aglayer is a neutral protocol being developed by、um, core contributors at Polygon Labs, which leverages zk and cdk to provide end users a seamless cross chain. Interoperable experience, where、um, although they're still performing cross-chain transactions and actions, but it really just feels like they're doing so on a single chain. No more wrapped, you know, ETH or wrapped tokens.、Um, no more bridging here, bridging there. So to simplify their experience end to end, and for developers and businesses, this will remove the fragmentation issue, which was brought up a lot in the、um, Ethereum Quorum event, which allows them to really enjoy a shared liquidity and users on Aglayer. Um, I think this also ties in with another significant topic、uh, mentioned at East Quorum, which was、um, transaction security for retail users. The fear of sending transactions to the wrong addresses was a common concern, and especially for those newbies、um, into the space.、Um, I think somebody mentioned a solution like、um, interoperable. And secure live validation methods in combination with a reliable blockchain explorer like us, or it could be anyone else. It should really be、um, useful tools to help address the problem. So this is on the retail end, and um, um, I think better educating people about what's happening in Web3 and helping to connect the gap between Web3 natives, the tech communities, and the normies like like me、um, were also raised multiple times, which I am an absolute advocate for、um, because I think. Like Metallic、um, concluded at the end, things are moving way too fast in the space. There's always new narratives coming up, and there are always new applications、um, on the same narratives coming out every single day. It's just really hard to keep up, and also because of that information overflow,、um, it's hard for the space to grow in terms of adoption.、Um, I think we also need to go beyond just. Um, educating or connecting with the Web3 natives, we must onboard new users in order to expand the user base, the space. You know, we where are these new users? Likely, they would be coming from Web2, or those are still sort of being curious, but a little, a little bit intimidated of diving into Web3. So I think right now,、um, and this. A lot of speakers at the event also confirmed this um, this uh, thought, where Web3 entry barrier is still a bit too high, and、um, all of the you know the jargons we use, all the tech stuff on the front end seems a little bit too kind of it's blocking new people from coming into the space. I can use our Explorer as a service,、uh, as a, as an example.、Um, when you check your transaction, when you interact with a smart contract, there's、um, internal. There's, Not just the transactions. There's internal trans- transactions. If you want to track the sequence of things, you look at event logs. You know these names to、um, not extensive, not advanced users in Web3. They probably don't know what they mean. And if they look into those data, even though every single word you understand, but when they're put together, you just don't know what it's trying to tell you. And We're trying to make things more readable, but I think we're still we still have a long way to go. This is just one example, but if you look at the DeFi space,、um, the new narratives of、uh, before it was just staking farming. Now there's restaking, and then there's the BTC layer two. You know all these new concepts. It's a bit intimidating for、uh, newbies to kind of onboard. So、um, these are the key things I heard. I'm sure Danny had has more to share. Yeah,、uh, thank you, Charlie. I, I think you brought really good points,、uh, such as the issue on jargon and really bringing the new crowd into Web3.、Uh, hence, why we've created a community like Ethkl in the first place for a safe space for these people.、Um, yeah,、uh, so I, I like how we're both agreeing on the same point, but we're coming from two different very points. You're building a product for these newbies, and we are kind of curating this ecosystem for newbies. And I just like to share on what I shared during the meeting. So in the meeting, I emphasized the importance of creating a balanced Web3 ecosystem. So I used、uh, Ethkl or Malaysia as a case study on my observations in creating a long-running community. 
I believe that we don't, we can't just attract the. Okay, so right now with ETHKL, the issue, uh, sorry, Malaysia, we have an issue where the majority of us are developers. We have a bunch of developers in Malaysia and talent pool, but we don't really have a um, much entrepreneurs, incubators, uh, funding, or even support from, uh, sorry, we have support from government, but not really on the awareness side. So I emphasize the importance of creating this balanced ecosystem by emphasizing a balance between investors, entrepreneurs, and supportive legal framework. Uh, our focus is on hosting events like hackathons to draw, uh, to draw in these players. And we also help advocate policies in Malaysia to help the government foster growth. Um, and I really believe that a diverse mix of talent and resources is really crucial for an ecosystem's sustainability and success. So that's what I shared. Um, yeah, I think that's all for me. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. Yes, and we actually already interviewed both Charlie from OK Link and also interviewed Danny as well. So starting from now, that will be our one on one interview. And we would like to hear what have you shared during the session at the Theory and Quorum. Thank you. Right. So um, with the session that we had at Ethereum Quorum, um, it was very much focused on what the decentralized infrastructure looks like in Africa. Um, and so, you know, in the current phase of Web3 in Africa, we have a situation where there's a lot of transactions happening from the OTC perspective, um, but it's very gray, right? Um, and so the reasons that contribute towards this kind of like gray situation is obviously infrastructure is a key component. Um, policy plays a key component. And so in Africa, the market is a little bit different, right? Um, although on one side you have active transactions and the numbers really, really look good. On another side, as I said, it's, you know, the utility of crypto and blockchain is very, very different, right? Um, I also would say that it's more of a necessity um, in Africa opposed to a luxury to, 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 to having the industry there. Um, and that's for a number of reasons. Um, we try to communicate the fact that, you know, it's, there, there's, a, there's the unbanked, right um in the rural areas um obviously internet access and development plays a key component um but some of the advantages are you have 70 percent of the world's youth there um and you know some of the positives that we identify as a market is you know if you look at the market cap for bitcoin alone and its contribution to the global economy um, Africa, in all its vastness of resources, only really has a GDP of 2.4 trillion, right? So if you're having um, opportunities like crypto, which has already demonstrated its ability to hit a market cap of 1 trillion already, you can already begin to see some of the potential economic opportunities um, in a place like Africa already, considering we have 70% of the global youth, and then we also have a very, very, you know, um, developing positive mobile penetration rate of about 70 percent um and so all these things coming together starts to make the place look very very appealing and you know some of the people that were our quorum already are putting their foot their feet in africa but i think most people generally don't seem to understand it and they don't necessarily know the contributions they can make and as mentioned the problems there are different right um and I mentioned that the quorum, for example, there's ways that NFTs could be used very differently in Africa, for example, on land litigation issues, where basically there's a lot of consolidation um, around data, right, that has been lost um, over a period of time. Um, IP protection is a very, very key component when it comes to Africa, you know, in terms of some of the things that we are producing out there that we've lost, you know, um, IP protection and intellectual property rights for. Um, and more importantly, also for investors and partners that are looking to come over there, the more data that you have, the more infrastructure that you, you invest in, that, you know, you now have an extended market. And I guess my concluding message at the quorum was very much surrounded on the fact that if decentralization was going to be successful globally, then Africa and other emerging markets needed to be a part of it as we have now with an advanced internet society, um, it works everywhere. Without the internet working in different parts of the world, you know, there's no real global accessibility. And that's got to be the same kind of message we need to push 
when it comes to Web3 development in emerging markets like Africa. Wow, thank you so much. I totally agree with you, right? Yeah, Africa is definitely has actually been a very important market for Web3 projects, and we hope that we could see a lot more over there. And let's talk about the future of Ethereum, because a lot of people have been wondering what happened to Ethereum during this bull run, right? And what are your thoughts on the future development of Ethereum, including the Dencon upgrade and the recent ETF approval? First, we'd also like to hear from Charlie at OKLink. Okay Thank you. Sure. Um... We do data, so let me address this on a data kind of perspective first. So, um, according to according to OK Group research team, and based on the Explorer's on-chain data, after that Denkun upgrade, Ethereum Layer Two transaction fees have uh, drastically decreased, and um, TPS has improved for sure. But the overall ecosystem has not really seen the expected kind of growth or boom. Um, I think the momentum for the Layer Two narrative remains uh, lukewarm post upgrade. Um, with I, this is probably a very hated speech, uh, with the exception of a few projects like Base and Autotron, which outperformed the other um, layer two projects, and um, I think this could be due to the inherent issues such as you know fragmentation of liquidity within Ethereum and um, the broader uh, crypto ecosystem and a lack of innovative applications. I think a lot of people might disagree with me saying this lack of innovative applications. Everybody thinks that their uh, applications are innovative, but I think um, the past few years we were in this building infrastructure stage and now because the space is all growing, we sort of entered into a discovery, uh, discovery stage where we try out different things, but it's not really a new thing, new thing. It's more of a, a derived version of what we had before. For example, DeFi, um, the framework is still the same, it's still DeFi. By introducing restaking, it's not really, it's not really a, a huge innovation. It's like a, a new version of the DeFi we, we had back then. And because I think projects and business, they're trying to, um, they're trying to grow their share of the pie, but the pie itself is not growing. And um, that's why you see so many different applications of very similar nature. Um, are coming out, which makes the space very, which makes it hard for users to understand what's really happening and to choose the right option for them. Um, this is one opinion. And um, another observation is um, over 60% of layer 2 trans transactions occur on base and Optron. But has has layer two really improved after this upgrade? I think it's um it's um worthy to point out that while layer two transa transactions have become more active, the transaction volume has not really seen a significant increase. And according to our data, layer two transaction volume did show an upward tick for a period short period after the upgrade was completed, but um, signs of weakening weakening appeared after May 9th and it has now basically returned to the pre upgrade level. So this is according to data. Like I said, I think. I think this is due to three main reasons. One is limited growth in uh, the wider adoption. So it's still circulating among the Web3 natives and the OGs. Um, very small number of newbies join the, sp join the space. And two, it's also related to uh, the first reason. There's a lack of real world applications or associations with real world activities. I think ways to improve this could be one example could be partnering with some Web2 or digital payment system like what Coinbase is doing. Um, this can really tap into the Web2 world or partner up with um, large um, international uh, financial institutions like JP Morgan and uh, develop some, web some applications that's suitable for Web2 payments, Web2 um, people. Um, that can really grow our pie. And um, the third one is lack of easy to understand education and communication with the newbies and the Web3 users that can't follow too closely with you know all the new things that's happening too much and too fast. That's oh my opinion. goodness. Charlie, yes, totally agree with what you say, right? We don't really have a lot of new users coming in. And on top of that, you know, education, 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 always the key, right? Thank you so yeah. much for sharing your thoughts. And next, we also like to hear from Danny. Danny, what are your thoughts on the future development of Ethereum, including the Dinkan upgrade and the recent ETF approval? Thank you. Here, here. I agree with, uh, I really agree with Charlie. Thank you for sharing your insight. I think uh, those were pretty valuable insight that it's very hard to uh, attain but um for me the denkun upgrade which is also known as uh, i believe it was eip 4844 which is meant to enhance scalability and security of um ethereum De i mean definitely it is a wonderful upgrade however i do resonate with um 
with Charlie that even though now that our grid is uh, is set, we are seeing that it hasn't really improved much on the uh, adoption side, which is what is expected after the upgrade. Um, so, yeah, uh, so it, it is also a thing that I'm trying to solve uh, as an ecosystem builder, which is for my event this year. Uh, I'm pretty sure you guys have been to a lot of Ethereum or blockchain related events. Uh, what I'm doing is that I'm just I'm not just making a bubble for the blockchain uh, industry, but also inviting all these uh, Web2 corporates. So from the tech, the sorry, oil and gas giants like Petronas to uh, payment systems within Malaysia that we already exist. And also like kind of inviting them to just have a conversation with, you know, like perhaps between Circle and the payment gateways in Malaysia on how they can uh, work together. Because a lot of people still believe that uh, even though the upgrade is here, the only people who worry about it are people within blockchain. People outside of blockchain still think, you know, it still costs a lot to transact uh, from one another. So I think awareness is really important and just having these kind of spaces for that conversation to happen and people to hear about it is very important. Um, yeah, so I, I, I do think it is a wonderful upgrade. Uh, I think it's just a matter of awareness to the uh, people who have problem statements that, hey, blockchain is now cheap and more secure and scalable. You can now use it to um, within your product. And on the ETF, uh, on the recent ETF approval, it is definitely a significant milestone. Uh, it opens up more avenues for institutional investments to come into Ethereum. And these kind of uh, these kind of investments would uh, help drive the uh, the growth of the, sorry the technology growth, but also the uh, adoption in the Web3 space. However, whether that will come into fruition as a result, uh, we're not sure. We will see. It's very hard to predict these kind of things. Um, but I can tell for I can say for sure that at, at the very least there is an avenue for institutional investors to come uh, to invest in the Web3 space, which I think is very important. So yeah, where I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to see uh, where these advancements can be leveraged to um, the Web3 space. I think that's that's all from me. Thank you so much, Danny. Yes, and just like you said, right, it's really important to host certain kinds of AMA sessions like this one to share a lot of information that only a few people could hear, right? Because you participated in the event and you were able to talk with Vitalik yeah. and others. Not, and we're very glad that you're willing to share. And Charlie, would you like to add any information on this? Thank you. Yes, on the Ethereum ETF um, issue, I completely agree with what Danny said. It, um, it's a sign of adoption. It's a positive thing. Um, but I think it's also at this very stage, I can't say it will be the same five, two years later. But at least for now, I think it's a double double edged sword because um, it also means that uh, traditional financial institutions, they have much more uh, liquidity than us, uh, uh, Web3 investors. And, you know, these these uh, Ethereum tokens, assets flow into custody of these giant financial institutions, which also can bring sell pressure, like what we've seen from uh, Mt. Gox isn't really a financial institution, but, you know, similar case. And the German government, when they when they're dumping their bag, it, it does impact the price a lot, but I think this is on an investment level, which um, I believe long term it's going to recover. But this is uh, a double-edged sword issue. But I, I still think long term wise, um, in general, um, ETF means adoption and it brings more institutional liquidity. It's still a good thing. Exactly. Oh my! Thank you so much, Charlie, for adding that to today's topic. And I also like to encourage everyone: be sure to follow our speakers as well. Follow One Thirty Seven Labs because there are a lot of amazing events ongoing. And I would like to check with Charlie or Danny: Do you have any questions that you also like to chat uh, regarding different regions and the domain of Web Three space, especially and Dell, the founder and CEO at Web Three? Akrala, he just shared a lot, right, about um, his uh, his thoughts regarding the domain of web three space. I, yeah, I see both of you open your mic. How about Charlie first? Thank you. Sure, sure. Um, what I what I'm about to say is, isn't really a question. It's to echo what um Del Tata said about Africa. You know, it's definitely an important market. I was just looking at our our numbers. Nigeria alone. I don't have numbers on other African countries as of yet, but Nigeria alone. Um, on our platform, it has over 1.6 million users, and this is one of the very top countries, um, outpacing a lot of European countries. I mean, this is only 
on our platform. So it's definitely a sizable population. And what uh, Dell Titus is trying to push is something that's probably closest to real world application as we can see. And it, it's going to take a lot of grinding and effort because you're trying to push needles um, through the government, through community and local public systems and because they're centralized. And what you're pushing is essentially a decentralized you know, ethos concept. So there, for sure, there will be conflicts and it's not going to be a, a easy journey. So I have a lot of respect for people like you trying to push this narrative. And if you end up having a, a success, then this can be broadcasted and used as a successful use case, you know, to showcase what blockchain Web3 can and help a, a real world economy grow. Yeah, and uh, just, just to add, well, this is a really good example of how Ethereum as a technology has really solved problem. Uh, in Africa's case, it's really the access to global economy. And I think that was very, very crucial for uh, the growth of certain individuals and, you know, uh, countries like Africa. From what I understand, um, don't quote me on this, but I, I understand that it's quite hard to access global economy uh, through banking in Africa. So, yeah, I just wanted to resonate on that, I guess. Uh, yeah, that's all for me. Thank you so much. And okay, so, well, I definitely appreciate all of our speakers are able to join us today. And it's been fantastic to share your experience from Edcon in Tokyo to discuss the exciting future of the Ethereum ecosystem. And I hope our speakers' insights and future plans have really sparked interest and provide valuable information to all of our audience over here. And as we continue to innovate and contribute to the growth of Ethereum, we certainly want to invite all of our audience to stay connect with us. So be sure to follow our speakers and their project and join the conversation again on our Twitter space that organized by 137 Labs. Thank you so much, everyone. With someone like I'm Zhang speaking. Thank you.